Welcome back. So now we're going to start our analysis of the physics of uh, an amphibian in salt water. So we have this hypothesis. The hypothesis was that somehow the frogs got transported along the Congo River. I don't have anything particularly deep to say about that other than that it's fascinating and worthy of our further consideration. And then we imagine that the frog gets deposited in the, the salt water of the the uh, Gulf of Guinea and because of the currents is transported. And what I want to do is I want to try to understand osmotic flows really. So, you know, this is, in a way you could say that it's a pretext for talking about the physics of osmotic pressure and the chemical potential and entropy and those things. But in a way, I, I don't think that's actually sincere. I think the more sincere statement is we're interested in this problem. We're interested in the question of, of what happens when you put a frog in salt water. And the way we're going to address that question is we're going to complement what I showed you earlier. There was experiments, uh, survival experiments that were done. We're going to complement that by a physics theorist analysis. So how long before the frog is depleted of water when we put it in salt water? So, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to consider a spherical frog and we're going to imagine osmotic pressure. Um, before I do that, I just want to say a few words about uh, salinity, and we'll come back to the units of this later. But, you know, I want you to look over there on the west coast of Africa. You'll see that the, high, the, con the salt content is actually rather high. And I think this is a very interesting graphic that tells us about sea surface salinity um, what I want you to notice, so this is, once again, the Gulf of Guinea, the west coast of Africa. You can see the islands of qu in question off to the left of each of the two diagrams. And the coloring describes for you the degree of salinity depending on time of year and whether or not it's post-rains or not. So, you know, it says, uh, demonstrating the dramatic changes in surface salinity depending on direct rainfall and, and in the drainages of Niger and Congo. Congo. Values below 30 uh, PSU characterize brackish waters and are seen extending far into the ocean, even in years of average rainfall. And so, you know, what I'm imagining, we're back to the, the points raised by George Gaylord Simpson, which is um, when you are talking about rare events, you know, for example, let's say that you decided to buy a house in Barrington, Rhode Island, which is a really nice place um, on the water. You know, it's a place where you can own a sailboat. And um, I know about it because I was a professor at Brown once upon a time. And, you know, when we bought a house, it was the first time I had bought a house ever and was basically clueless. And you talk to people about insurance and then you learn words like 100-year floodplain. And, you know, if we pay attention to the story of the Mississippi, you know, there, there are given years where farmland is severely flooded. And so I'm just saying if we get in that mindset of George Gaylord Simpson about rare events, then... You could imagine that there could be years where the degree of salinity would be even lower than the brackishness that you see on the right-hand side. So I'm going to try in this short vignette, I'm going to try to describe for you in qualitative terms the free energy balance that's associated with osmotic pressure. And then we will do a concrete and mathematical description of entropy in the next vignette, because in the absence of entropy, I can't compute the free energy balance. And then we will, once we have that entropy in hand, once we have the linear transport laws in hand, then what we will do is we will actually compute the, the loss of water by putting a frog into salt water, you know, an approximation, a story, you know, a narrative. It's not, it's not the concrete calculation. So let's look at what's going on here. So if you look at the left-hand side, I have this U-shaped object. And the way I want you to imagine it is that initially, the membrane in the center at the bottom is impermeable. That is to say that the two sides are absolutely ignorant of each other. There's no sense in which the glucose, glucose on the right is something that the water on the left knows about. But now let's say that I take a drill and I put a little, you know, little teeny tiny holes that allow water to pass across that membrane, but not the glucose. 
the way I think of this is what will happen is a competition. I think in the, some previous vignettes in the last few days, I talked about the ubiquitous nature of competition as dictating the processes in the world around us. Here is a perfect example. Work will be done in the sense that water will lift up above the level that it is on the left-hand side. So work has to be done, MGH type work, and we will calculate that. But the advantage, so that's the cost, but there's also an advantage. The advantage is that the entropy of the glucose molecules on the right-hand side will be higher than the entropy on the left-hand side, left-hand image. In other words, by filling up the right-hand part of the reservoir with more water, stated simply, the glucose has more ways to jiggle around. And that's equivalent to more entropy. Free energy is U minus TS, U being energy, internal energy or enthalpy, and TS being temperature times entropy. And so that competition, we're going to plot F of H. F meaning for energy as a function of H, which is how high the water went on the right-hand side. That's going to be our analysis of this osmotic pressure effect. And I'm claiming that this beautiful, simple, and in some sense counterintuitive effect is totally uh, accessible as a simple you know, uh, problem in entropy in energy balance, for energy balance. So we're going to talk in detail about the second law of thermodynamics. Um, this is Cedric Villani, who's at the tomb of Boltzmann. Uh, Villani is a quite amazing French mathematician, and um, I would recommend that you listen to some of his lectures. A very clever, interesting guy. And so Boltzmann's tomb has this equation, which we're going to go into in detail in the next vignette. S equals K log W. K is now called Boltzmann's constant. S on the left-hand side is a macroscopic quantity. It's the entropy. W on the right-hand side is a microscopic quantity in the sense that it's a, it's a number that tells you how many different distinct states there are. On the right-hand side of this image, I show you a conception of the second law of thermodynamics that I'm very fond of because it's a simplification, idealization, and an abstraction of many more complicated processes. Let's look at part B for starters. So let's say you have a partition between the two sides and the partition has wheels, but for the moment, the wheels are locked. And now I remove the brake. What we know will happen is that that wall will move until a particular quantity on the two sides of the partition is equal. What particular quantity? The pressure. When the pressure is equal, the thing will stop moving because force on the two sides is balanced. And so by Newton's uh, first law, if you like, it's equilibrated. In the top image, Let's say that the partition is adiabatic, which is to say no thermal energy can be conveyed from one side to the other. And as you can see with the thermometers, the thermal energy on the left is higher than the thermal energy on the right, meaning the molecules are jiggling around faster on the left-hand side. If I now, by some trickery, turn the wall into a wall that permits the transfer of heat, we know what will happen, and that is the system will evolve until what? Until two, th two qu quantities are equal. What two quantities? The temperature on the two sides. The bottom example is similar in spirit, which is related to the one we just said. In this case, the green molecules will pass from the left side until the right, to the right side until the chemical potential is equal on the two sides. The chemical potential has equal status with temperature and pressure, which were the ones that uh, correspond to the top two. So what does the second law of thermodynamics say? It says something that's almost a tautology in the sense that it says Systems that are started out in an improbable state will evolve until they reach the most probable state. In this room where I'm sitting right now, if I had a way to take all the molecules and put it on one half of the, of the, the room, the probability of that is one half to the power m, where m is the number of molecules in the room. Why? Because the probability that a given molecule is over on the right-hand side of the room is a half. I flip a coin, and if it, I get a heads, I put it over there. And the probability that all the molecules in this room is that I got consecutively m heads. What's the probability of that? It's one half to the power m. In other words, where I place the molecule, left part of the room or right part of the room, is based upon flipping a coin. And so the probability is you know, incredibly low that all the molecules would be on the right side. I could, of course, contrive that 
by preparing the system artificially with all the molecules on the right hand side and then the second law says the system will continue to change until it reaches the most probable state what is the most probable state it's a state of uniform distribution anything other than that is lower probability entropy measures that so that highest probability corresponds to the maximum in the entropy so again the plan of action is that we are going to compute the entropy and in light of that we'll compute the osmotic pressure i think i'll do that in two separate short vignettes so the first one will be about entropy the second one will be about osmotic pressure and then once we have that in hand what we will do is we will use these simple linear relationships between disequilibrium and flows so let me just give you a, a little bit of an introduction to this right now and then we will also have probably a short vignette about the linear transport laws uh, as part of this whole exercise on the amphibians and um, the islands of the Gulf of Guinea. So here, all these different laws tell us the same basic thing. The column called disequilibrium degree, I would prefer that they had called it degree of disequilibrium, is a measure, if you like, of how far out of equilibrium the system is. Let's take the second row, chemical diffusion. So dc by dx is the gradient in concentration. It's telling me that the concentration is not uniform, but rather it's got some slope to it. And so the bigger the slope, the more out of equilibrium the system is. The column that says law says that the flow of matter, in this case J sub K, is linearly related to the degree of disequilibrium, and the coefficient relating those two quantities is the diffusion coefficient. Similarly for heat conduction, there is the Fourier law. The Fourier law tells me if there's a gradient in temperature, that will be smoothed out over time. There will be a heat flow, J, with units of energy per area per time. That's what the units of J are. And that will be proportional to the gradient in temperature. The coefficient of proportionality is the so-called thermal conductivity. So for osmotic flows, if I have a, a gradient of concentration across a membrane, delta C, so delta C is a change in concentration across a membrane, then the corresponding flux is proportional to that delta C, and the permeability is the coefficient that links um, those two quantities. So um, you can see here, I'll talk about this in more detail when we talk about actual osmotic flows, but people have gone and measured the properties of, uh, of pig ear, for example, and frog skin, which you see at the bottom. And what, you, what I hope you can appreciate is that um, the permeability is, is very different in the, in the, the different cases. So, um, so well, anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this in a little while and I, I hope you'll find it amusing. So, you know, people can make measurements, for example, using radioactivity, you can find out how much of a given molecule flows across a membrane passively. So where are we? I'm done with this vignette. This was an introduction to the physics. And now what we have to do in the coming vignettes is we have to actually implement the physics, which is to say write the equations and, and you know, work out the details. So that's what's coming next. But let's not, you know, we have to keep our eye on the prize. What is the prize? We want to figure out the rate at which water is lost from a frog if we put it in salt water. And the reasoning behind that is I want to find out, you know, I'm going to use as a criterion for death uh, losing, let's say, two-thirds of its water or something like that. You know, it's a little bit of a contrivance. Again, this is, this is a toy model of, a, of a, a, a characterization of a problem as a pretext to try to think about some of the key ideas. Entropy, equilibrium, osmotic pressure, linear transport laws. That's a lot of really important physics that can help us understand a ton of different phenomena about the world around us.